and then I, if I hope to talk, I'll give you some idea about the findings that you are not just about the score because one of my messages is just the country score is only part of the information that PISA gives. And then I hope to have some time to give you some ideas about teaching for mathematical literacy. So the key ideas of PISA. PISA is made by governments and the main job is to help governments make decisions about education policy and practice and by that in that way improving the outcomes of education. So they chose 15 year olds because it is near the end of compulsory schooling in most countries and they chose reading, mathematics and science as the basic things to assess because of a belief that these are the subjects that are critical for economic development in countries. So that is why they, there's been a focus on, on mathematics, reading, science. And I guess that there are now various studies to show that young people who do well in PISA tend to do well after they leave school. So for example, there is, um, I don't know, can you, can you see my mouse? Yeah, down, down here. There is a, a, an Australian project called the Longitudinal Survey of Australian Youth. And they look at how, what happens as children um, leave school and go to work until they're about 30. And the results of those research, that research shows that PISA scores are quite a good indicator of success. Another key thing about PISA is the idea is that all the reports are free on the website and the data is freely available to everyone. Now, I've just got a long list here of what has happened from PISA from 2000 to hopefully next year. You'll see that it grew quite quickly from 43 countries. In PISA 2012, we had 67 countries. We had 43 languages, half a million students, and about because each country changes its questions just a little bit to, so that its students understand about 60 different versions of the test, different languages, different units. Yeah, in Australia, we have metric units. I think you do too in Indonesia. But in America, for example, they have uh, feet and inches. And of course, some of the context need to be changed. Last year, um, well, PISA was supposed to go ahead this year, but in fact, it's been postponed for one year. So we, I expect, they're expecting about 88 countries there. So that's a brief history. I think the main thing to remember about PISA is that there is a lot of information and the idea is that the results will be um, statistically sound for whole countries. So the schools are randomly selected, usually about 150 in a country, about 35 students for school, 15 years old, and there's very strict sampling criteria so that if the countries are in the report, they will have passed um, assessment for these criteria. Now, each student does about two hours of test and about 30 minutes of questionnaires. And in that test, they have a mix of reading, science and mathematics. They have in the questionnaire about their family, what, you know, the support and the status of their family. 
there are questions about how students learn, way, the ways that they approach their learning and also what they think about their school. And then there's some questionnaires also for schools and for teachers. Now, because it's such a, the idea is to assess a country or a particular group like the girls in a country or the boys in the country or the students who speak um, a home language, a, a, a different home language to the, the national language. The results of individual students and schools don't make any, don't really make any sense. The idea is that a lot students do different questions and there's about 13 for 2012, I know, there were 13 booklets and different students do different ones of these sort of booklets. So you can't say some students will have hard questions, some students will have easier questions. You can't say how well one student did. Now, I just found this on the internet. So here we have a photo uh, 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 from the internet, something about PISA 2018, the worldwide ranking. And you'll see that China is right up here, above 500 for its score. I think it's an average, this one of math, science and reading. You'll see Australia is here at number 21, and you'll see that Indonesia is here in 71. And this is the score. They've given Indonesia 3382.0 and they gave Australia 499.0. Now that is what most people understand by PISA. And one of my main lessons that I hope you will understand today is that there's a lot more to it than just thinking about this number and especially than just thinking about the ranking. So, the sorts of results we have from PISA. We get the overall scores, we just showed you those. The mean is about 500 for OECD countries, standard deviation 100. Over time, an important thing is that you can track your country's project progress and we'll have a look at that but of course the rank whether you come 71 or 10 depends on which other countries participate so the rank is not a good indicator then of course as well as those the overall scores we have scores on a lot of different components and we get percentages of students at levels and also there's a lot of data on the effect of variables on learning. We might be able to have a look at some of that later on. So just to have a look at some of these things. This is an example of the data that's available on the PISA website. So this was from 2018 and this shows countries and the difference between boys and girls. So in this country here, the girls were a little better than the boys in 2018. In this country here, the girls were quite a bit behind the boys. And you'll see that in most countries, the boys are a little better than the girls in mathematics. The Indonesia is down here but you can see the girls are a little bit better than the boys in 2018. So there's all sorts of data like that and it comes very easily from the PISA website. So as well as, so, but it only comes for the groups that have been specified in advance. So like boys and girls. Um, I think Another really important thing is where the rank, the fact that Indonesia is 71, is not especially important. It depends on how many countries 
uh, participate. But the score is made so that you can compare one year to another. And here you see Pisa's mathematics score from 2003 to 2018 with an upward trend. So I think this is the OECD score. Do you notice how the OECD score is going down? Indonesia is going up, I'd say. OECD is going down and that's because more countries come into the OECD. Um, and that's taken because the OECD is the organisation that pays for this survey. Um, they, they always will try to make the OECD mean about 500. Okay. So you see what's happened in mathematics in Indonesia. One of the interesting things is the country note for, for Indonesia is that in Indonesia, then the percentage of children who have been involved in the at school who have been sampled from has changed enormously. In 2003, in 2001, I think this is the first. I'm sure that should be 2001, 2003. Um, they had 40, only half of the 15 year olds were at school are able to be sampled and now 85% of the 15 year olds can be sampled. So that means there's been a huge change. You would know much more about this than I do, but a huge change in Indonesian education for which 15 year olds are at school. And so to I think to improve the average score while also improving, you know, catering education for such a much broader group of the population, I think that seems a very good thing. And in fact, the OECD said that if they, their estimate is that if Indonesia had only looked at the top 25, uh, if you look at the top 25% of students from that time to that time, they thought there was a 55 point improvement. So these raw, the numbers, just the sort of overall score, there is a lot more information um, th th than uh, you would expect. Um, now, another interesting thing that, um, a way that the data is presented in PISA is that they, divide students into six levels. Level one at the bottom and level six at the top. And the PISA um, committee, well perhaps the, gov the, the organisers of PISA decided that students should really for success in, in, in their life to know enough mathematics or reading or science, level two will be a cutoff. So they feel that level two is what a person would need for, to, for successful use of what they've learned at school in their rest of their lives. So um, a lot of the time PISA talks about whether students are over level two or under level two. And you can see that Indonesia there, this is, a, I think, quite a critical uh, number here, the 28%. That's some, a number that you could watch from year to year, which, which students are above or, low, or level two. And you can see that level five means students who can really do quite uh, sophisticated things. So just to, um, I couldn't, find, oops, go back, I couldn't find a graph like this for Indonesia, um, but when we look at the graph, this is the graph for Australia in from 2003 to 2018, and you can see here that this is the level two, 
this is we have 23 percent of the students now at level two whereas before we had 19 percent and we had six percent at at the in the top level in 2003 and now we only have two so in Australia many people are concerned about this and don't really understand why it is happening but by looking at this distribution of learning it really gives you a better picture of what sort of what sort of change not just looking at an average score okay so another useful thing is that for each of the outcomes the PISA results give a description of what people at each level could do so they give a description this this is the description for level five so this the several the second top level and it describes how they students can make models for complex situations they can see constraints look at assumptions they can devise their own problem solving strategies they can deal with complex representations graphs and other ways of presenting data they can work with symbols and this they can communicate what they their interpretations and their reasoning so i think if you're going to sort of look at what the characteristics of items trying to look at the level descriptions gives you an idea of what went behind uh, the the construction of the items okay so uh, I'd like it's very hard to make this an informal session but would anyone like to ask a question at this point Uh, well, participants, do you have any question until this answering? Please raise your hand to ask directly or write down on chat box. Okay. I actually can't see my chat box because I've had to put my... Um, my screen is on top of it. <laughs> uh, it's okay. I will read it for you, first, Jason. Yeah. Perhaps we'll go along, and then if someone has a question, please put it in, and then you could let me know. So, yeah. a lot of information was gained about mathematics in 2012. And this is because every time PISA is, is offered, it focuses on a different, quest, a different main domain. So it, the cycles between reading, mathematics and science, reading, mathematics and science. So the first time that mathematics was thoroughly investigated was in 2003. And then the second time, so we had this was the, there was a small bit of mathematics here in this year a lot of items were development developed and the framework was carefully done and then in 2003 we also used the did more we changed a lot of things and we did in-depth teaching in-depth assessment of mathematics there developed a lot of new items and since then no new items have been made so 2015 2018 did some items from 2012 and indeed some items going all the way back to here so that's how the scores can be compared there's a bank of items that go from one test to the next in 2022 
that will be the next time that mathematics is thoroughly investigated. So we have trend data between and then thorough investigations. So the main question then, if you are going to assess mathematics, what is it that you should assess? So, so what the OECD, the governments want, is knowledge and skill that students have learned at school and their ability to use them in everyday tasks and challenges. So PISA, unlike the TIMS international studies, is focused on these everyday tasks and challenges. And so these, what is the, the job of this a framework, which is the description of PISA mathematics, is to say, what sort of items should you ask? what characteristics of those items are important and how you're going to balance the items in the survey. So for example, if you give 90%, nearly all the items on um, algebra and no items on statistics, that will benefit some countries, not benefit others. So the balance of items is a very important thing to determine where the countries come. If you want to look at the uh, PISA 2002 framework, you can very easily find it on the web. Not the whole thing, but uh, it will be finalised later on, but there's already, I'll show you some of that later on in a few minutes. Okay, so my I've got a question now. So. I'm going to give you one or two minutes and I would like you to look at these five questions and think which do you should th believe should be asked in a PISA assessment. Okay, so you've got a few minutes to look at this, these questions and think which one, if you were asking P if you were writing questions for PISA, which one would you put into the test? Yeah, I'm, would anyone like to uh, explain what they think? I think problem five is probably. Problem five? Five, yeah. Five, okay. Right. What other, what problem do you, what, does anyone have another idea? Number three or four. Uh, and would you like to explain why number three or number four? Yeah, it is uh, something like uh, using uh, what we call uh, application or something like that. Yes. Yes. Any other ideas? In PISA, I think uh, not so much uh, the problem of uh, proofing. That's right. Yes. Yes. So there are there are no questions like the first one. Say what this is, and there are also no questions about proving. Although there is explaining mathematical reasons for some things but the one here I'll just I'll show you which one it is it actually came from this website so this is a website from a German company that is trying to make sales to put on ships 
And in fact, that's why it's this question, number four. The flight is flying at the angle, how long is the rope? So the reason that, so this is one of the characteristics that we try very hard for PISA to, even though the problems might be unexpected, they are usually based in real world things. And here's, and this is, this is this, this is a picture of the kite being trialled on a ship. So, th this is the question that came from it. I've just reorganised this one to get, get it in here. It says 95% of world trade is moved by sea. Um, ships use diesel fuel. Engineers are planning to develop wind power for ships with kites and they will reduce diesel consumption. And so then there are three questions about this that were in the PISA 2012 survey. One is, this first one just says um, that at a higher, above, if you put the, the kite up high, then the wind is stronger and it will push the ship faster. So how fast is the speed going when it's higher? So that's really um, a, um, just a, a percentage question. And then this is the one that's most like question four, is what is the length of the rope for the kite sail to pull the ship when it's at an angle of 45 and 150 meters? And for this one, they have drawn a diagram to help students. I suppose partly because you wouldn't know which part of the, you wouldn't know how long the rope was and how high, whether you, this was 150, so maybe they needed to do that. And then there is, um, because I just thought I, um, might be interesting for you too, just to know what sort of notes they have with the translation to, so that people in different countries have the same experience. So people were told to keep metric units, keep the word si sky sails because that was the name of the country. They were told they could change the decimal point or the to use the decimal comma. And in the next one, you'll see that PISA has its own currency called the Z. So the final question is to calculate how much a ship might, how much money a ship might save if it um, had a sail like this. And so there's a lot of information here and you just have to pick out a few things like the consumption per year, the cost of fuel, how much it reduced by and the cost of buying the sale. So that's really quite a complex problem. It's a complex problem. It's got a lot of steps in it. And for PISA, you, only, you either get the full credit on this question or nothing. So one of the things that students have to do for PISA items is to make sh is to carry out multiple steps correctly. And um, if I if you were a teacher, you probably would mark. You wouldn't just give all the marks if a student got the right answer and no marks. I would try to give intermediate marks if if I was teaching, but. For PISA, because so many different people have to mark the questions in so many different countries, then it's very important that um, there's, it, the marking system is very easy and very straightforward. Okay, so this is what mathematical literacy is defined to be. So capacity to reason and to formulate, employ and interpret mathematics. Okay, and the point, the idea, they're trying to 
test whether students can recognise the role that mathematics plays in the world and make judgments and decisions that are needed to be a good citizen. So that's, uh, that definition is what determines which items are asked. Okay, um, just going to jump over this one. This is the PISA 2002 framework um, that is on the web of the OECD at the moment. And this sets out the main, the things that are going to be you, the, the way that the items are going to be divided up. So there'll be items about people's personal lives, about work lives, about being a citizen of a country and sort of items that require a sort of scientific understanding. These 21st century skills, they will, they're sort of sitting in the background perhaps. And then these are the, the names for the areas of the content that, is go, that are going to be in there. And 25% of the items will be in there, in there, in there, and in there. And those, how well students do on these things will be will be that that's the, that's what the score does that there'll be a score for this a score for this a score for this a score for this and then going through here there are also four scores some of these items are what we call formulate items some of them are employ items some of them interpret items and some are just mathematical reasoning items so Every country will get one, two, three, four scores and th from, the, from there and by cutting the items in the other direction, going through this cylinder like that, another one, two, three, four scores. So eight scores for each country. In um, 2012 we had um, only seven scores and you can see that Indonesia um, did quite well on this uncertainty in data and the shape and space better than the change in relationships which has often got a little bit of algebra in it and the quantity and then also uh, I'll, I'll talk in a moment about what these ones are but um, you can see that these two, the formulate employ about the same and interpret done better by Indonesia in 2012. So this is what I'm saying, there's a lot more information that available than, um, a, a lot more information available. And for example, the, um, the sailing ships items, we just had a look at three of them, one of them, they were in different content areas, even though they had, they were all about the same ship with the same sail. Um, that's why they were classed as scientific. They were all multiple choice. The first one was very easy. The last one was quite difficult. This is a score. And two of them were classed as employing and one of them is formulating. Okay, so I think we'll just have a, um, these three categories of formulate, employ and interpret are designed to try to describe the process of doing mathematics. And I like this image from Singe, it's very old. 1951, it's nearly as old as I am, but um, what it says is that if you want to use mathematics in the real world, there's three steps. First, you have to dive out of the real world into the world of mathematics. So here I've got a person diving in to the world of mathematics, and this step is the formulate step. 
And these, this is one of the things that PISA tries to tell you how well your students can do. And then you have to swim in the world of mathematics, do calculations and solve equations and draw graphs and all sorts of other things. That's this employee process. And PISA tries to tell you how well your students can do that. And then when you've got an answer, you've got to climb out of the water. You can see I drew this man climb, trying to climb out and you have to climb back and think whether this is a sensible answer for this question. Sensible in the real world. So there is the man and this, this he says um, you have to swim and get the prediction and then climb out carrying it in your teeth because you're using your hands to climb out. So these are really the three things that PISA tries to report. Okay, now I'm just going to jump through some of these um, because I'm wanting to move on a little bit um, faster here but this would be one of the items that was a formulating item a, a question about how do you dive in to do the mathematics this is quite an easy question 63% correct is much is higher than the average the, uh, percent for items um, and so this is a res recipe for salad dressing um, you could change although you couldn't change the country the, the quantities you're in Indonesia they might have a different you know not call it salad dressing and then here it tells you the various quantities so a student has to work out that it's a recipe for 100 millilitres of sauce that they want this so they'll have to increase by 50 percent so they have to increase the 60 and there's 90 so that's an example of a formulating item and then the sailing ships was counted as an example of an employing item so really what it's doing is fairly much just testing the, the, the length of the rope, really just testing if students know well, Pythagoras' theorem essentially and can use it there. So because all of this is drawn, there is not much of the first step. It's really a second step question. And I'll give you an example of an interpreting question. Um, would you like to, you can have a minute to do this one yourself. So this is about driving in a car. This question I think was used in 2000 and not since. Um, so during the drive, a cat ran in front and she put on the brakes and she missed the cat and then she went home. And then the questions are, for example, what time did she hit the cat? So that, that would be one of the questions. Would anyone like to tell us how they, they've looked at that? Uh, pardon me, Prof. Stacey. Uh, would you like to, would any, can someone say when the cat, when they, when she missed when she did not hit the cat. When did the cat run across the road? What time? Uh, maybe um, at nine past four. Uh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. so here, thank you. She starts off and then this is a graph of speed. Okay, so the student has to look at that and then she gets goes faster and faster. She accelerates for a couple of minutes, drives at a constant speed 
and suddenly her, her speed drops very quickly. So nine, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is when the, the cat. So it's questions like that, interpreting the outcome of, say, a graph. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've just spent a couple of minutes talking about the sort of findings that you might have from PISA. Okay, so as I said, one of the things you get is the score. In 2012, we had scores for the three processes, the formulating, the employing, and the interpreting, as well as the overall score, which of course is a combination of these three. So I think we've discussed that. Um, a very interesting thing is that um, in some some countries are really good at some things. So, so for example, the Asian countries, chi the Chinese, chi the Chinese culture, Asian countries uh, in ch China, Korea, uh, well, and um, Hong Kong, those sorts of places, very good at formulating relative to themselves. Oh, I think I've. Um, so if we just look at them themselves, they're not so good at interpreting. They're very good at formulating. In the English speaking countries, we're sort of, these two are about the same, but we're good at interpreting. In a lot of the European countries, they're not so good here, good at those two. So there's quite a lot of interesting patterns that help us understand what mathematics is being taught and how it's being taught in various countries. So for example, uh, overall, the whole of the world, boys do much better than, at formulating than girls and a little bit better there and a little bit better there. In Indonesia, um, these two, the formulate and employed, seem to be good. Actually, I'm wondering if I've got, uh, sorry, no, no, I, in Indonesia, yeah, it was the interpreting was good. Those two were about the same. And in Indonesia, the boys were a little bit better than the girls on those two and about the same there. So lots of things to explore if you're interested in. Another interesting thing um, that happened in 2012, and you might, it will quite likely also that I imagine in 2022 they may be planning similar sorts of questions is that students answered questions about um, the sort of mathematics they were doing at school and one question they were asked was to say how confident they were to do a range of applied mathematics tasks like um, how to tile a f how many tiles to tile a floor, um, yeah, finding how much something cost if you got some money, a discount, finding distances on a map, a, a range of items like this, and then some other things that were really just out of the school abstract mathematics from the school curriculum. And then they also were asked how com well basically how confident and also asked how often did they do those sorts of items and one of the things that interested me about this the, these are boy the boys and the girls this is from the whole world and you see that the boys and the girls have very similar confidence for the school abstract work but in some items, the girls have much less confidence solving these problems. Not in every country, and I don't know what it's like in Indonesia, uh, but over the world, you see this enormous drop off here in confidence of girls compared to boys. And I wonder if that's perhaps one of the reasons why fewer girls go into scientific work into mathematical work perhaps not it's not a difference in ability that's a difference in confidence 
Okay, and then this is, students also said how often they'd done these various types of problems. I was interested to see that Indonesia was one of the countries in the top three that said they often, they said they reported doing the applied math sort of questions the most frequently of any country, of any top three countries in the world. So I was, so, but again, I won't, I won't stop on any of this, but I, I do think there is a lot here that you can understand about mathematics in your country and in comparison to other countries. The other thing that there's, they've done is try to look and see what actually, if students say they do a lot of certain sorts of questions, what does that really mean for their achievement? And it seems that the more the students say that they do that abstract mathematics, the higher their achievement is. So that's a strong positive connection between the formal mathematics and the um, and the PISA score. With the applied mathematics, it's actually quite quadratic. It comes up. This is the OECD, and this is the um, the other countries. So they rate the. If you never do applied problems, it's your score is low. If you do more, it's better. If you do more, and then but then here you reach a sort of ceiling. And if you do them so much more, the it seems that the the score seems to go down. So I think there's quite a lot here to to helping understand what is a good curriculum for a school. So I've just tried to pick some things that might be uh, things that you won't have heard about, read about PISA in the newspaper here. And then just a few minutes about how I think we can teach for mathematical literacy. So what does all of this perhaps mean for teaching and for school curriculum? Okay, so I think these are the things that I have learned. Okay, one is there's a lot more to PISA than just your ranking in the world. The ranking, okay, you know about the ranking. Let's look beyond that and see what we can learn. The other thing is I know that because of the PISA test, many countries have become interested in teaching for mathematical literacy. But that's not the reason why it's important. It's not important so that you can do well on PISA. It's important so that your students um, are actually going to be well prepared for the lives that they're going to lead and your country. So individual and country uh, values of education. I think the, um, as a teacher or a curriculum writer, you could look at the sort of categories that PISA has allocated problems to and to think whether those sorts of categories are well balanced in your teaching. Now, I know that the PISA, the items, the released items, there's hundreds of released items, they can provide a lot of good ideas for teaching. However, you have to understand that as a teacher, you, you can do a lot more than the sort of things that PISA can do. You know, writing items for an international assessment is very limited. They can only be quite short. You can't have any any props, you can't, students can't experiment, they've only got a few minutes to do it, you can't ask them to write a lot, you can't use the local environment or the, your student's interest and whereas if you're, as a teacher, you can do much better, you could use PISA-like items but you can make them so much better for your students because they don't have to 
have all of those constraints that something for half a million children has to do. So I think that you know, mathematical literacy, it's a big, um, you know, trying to approach mathematical literacy is a big central role for students, for teachers in schools. So just some quick ideas. PISA can't ask about today's news. It can't ask about the local things that your local children are interested in. Here is an item that you can see says it was a real graph, but it's not real now and it wasn't ever real to some children. Teachers can make it real to their students now if they think about it. Um, we've already talked about the multiple step problems. So here's one of um, paving, uh, getting tiles for, not for the service area of the shop or the counter, but tiling this. So lots and lots of different steps. But PISA only gives you right or wrong. But a teacher, of course, would give much more and a teacher could expect um, students to be explaining their answers well, using the correct units, all sorts of things. PISA, PISA would mark you correct if you get the right answer without any units. Um, so yeah, that's the um, that's the code there. If you give the answer 31.5 in PISA, then you get the full marks because they're not trying to mark an individual student's work or showing a student how to do it. They're just trying to get evidence about how well students in that country can do that thing. And then if you make a mistake, you only get one in this case and otherwise you get cre no credit. So teachers can expect a lot more than just the sort of right wrong. Okay, another thing I thought you might like to notice is that there are some new areas to be assessed in 2022. And one of them is this mathematical reasoning that wasn't in PISA before. So that's been a decision um, of the, um, and I'll show you an example question for that. There's also going to be a bit more emphasis on statistic, statistical variation rather than perhaps just data. And the, because so the question, the the future is that the assessment will be on computers. They've started to include some mathematical strategies that come from sort of computer apps. So for example, here, there's a lot, here is, this is one of the PISA 20, 2022 sample items. So it's not a real item, um, but it, it's a sample item. But they, this is a big spreadsheet. And then to answer these questions, you could do it anyway, but the quick way would be to sort according to population for example or court according to that and so they're expecting some of perhaps in this case spreadsheet skills or you know using being able to think about using a computer to sort those being included now as part of mathematics and this one is a mathematical reasoning item so this is not the sort of thing that would have been asked in PISA before. Previously, PISA items would have had a context, but this one is just mathematical reasoning. So I think that's, that'll be a change for 2022, and it'll be interesting to see how that affects the country rankings, because it will. Okay. Um, then just I've just got a couple more minutes I, I know that I'm running out of time um, but I think well I think I've already said this really that yeah PISA items interesting from a mathematical literacy point of view but if you were using them in your class 
you know, then you can actually just do so much a lot, so much more, more elaborated answers, more complex marking scheme. Students could get their own data. You know, you could have they could be more difficult, more extended. So many different things. And just to finish in the last five minutes. So I've been working for um, for the um, Australian Academy of Science. We have a resolve. It's a project called Resolve, and I think that this shows you if you're looking at mathematical literacy, it's not just a few items that you can put here or there. You know, really, you could also extend to a units of work that have a flavour of mathematical literacy throughout them. So, for example, um, there is a unit about um, these are chickens. Um, hens, hens, and they um, perhaps you have the same thing. They have shows to see which hen is the best, and every hen comes in a box made of wire, and they make big arrays of boxes like this, and the, every one, one hen in each. And so uh, there's a unit of work about the chicken boxes from here that is looking at early algebra and how students can look at uh, building up equations for example for how many sticks you need to make this and how many pieces of um, plasticine you need at the corners or in here yeah these are actually um, you know, metal metal cages so you might like to look at that there's four lessons on chicken boxes, but really they're on algebra. We also had a set of lessons on the, these is um, Euclidean deductive geometry. But we've had a look, for example, at a, this is a car jack. You know, it goes if the car wheel, if the tire goes flat, you put it underneath the wheel, and then the, then it, underneath the axle, sorry, not underneath the wheel, and then you part, you press it down, and the car goes up. Car jack. So how does a car jack work? It's really very simple things about isosceles triangles. Okay, so we have a unit of work that does things like why the car jack makes the car go straight up. Which is very important. The same unit of work, but a different level, looks at how this we call this a scissors lift. You know, up and down. What is the geometry? It's junior secondary geometry. That's allowing that to go up and down in a straight line. And this is we call it, this is. Um, do you, you know these they go up to they go up to um, to fix wires that are very high up the, the man jumps in the cage and then slowly pushes up to fix what fix high, tr high trees or something so this is also this belongs to the properties of a parallelogram make this work um, We've also got units on mathematical modelling. Uh, for example, this one is talks teaches students about what you want from a mathematical model. It isn't exact, but it has to work. And this, for example, is a rule for de deciding how long you would take, you would need to allow to go for a walk. So the rule is one hour for every five kilometres and another hour for every 600 metres that you have to go up. So this is one of the units in mathematical, the mathematical modelling unit. And another one, for example, would be about the importance of um, safety with long vehicles. In Australia we have these pictures on the back of trucks to remind people not to come too close and this this unit is about the cornering there. 
there's a lot of geometry of course in this and uh, students don't have to do this they can do it if they're at the right level or they can do it much more numerically and then at the end we try to get them to make some recommendations for the width of the road in their own local area they can have a look at this all of this real data uh, to do with it they, they could also of course get their own data so there's some of the things that we've been trying to do to bring mathematical literacy um, more solidly into the curriculum um, and I, actually I, I'm just going this one this is right down for five-year-old students um, getting them here asking giving them the job of planning a game for children the game is to throw uh, see who can get closest to the target which is this little one up here and they have to decide what sort of balls there are how and these children can't yet measure so they're learning about measuring by informal units putting the things together but all through an um, in a sense an inquiry approach combining their evidence together at the end okay well um, I hope that you've um, had a look at PISA realize some of the depth that you can have from it and also um, perhaps you might like to follow up and have a look at our some of our lovely resolve resources um, that are all free and all on the web okay so thank you ever so much it's Oh, well, thank you, Prof. Stacey. Uh, uh, we are going to the next station. Next is coaching and mentorship of PISA practice. So for participants, make sure you keep your question to the next session. This session will be guided by Ms. Nurul Aziza SPD and Mr. Riyadi Muslim MPD. Ms. Nurul and Mr. Riyadi, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Ms. Abil, for the time. Uh, good morning, Prof. Thank you for the explanation. It's very uh, detailed and very uh, wonderful. Actually, we have some uh, problem in making questions for visa assignment. So in this time, I, I would like to explain our question. Eh? So I want you to help us <laughs> just to review our question. So I need your recommendation for this. Uh, are you getting my explanation? OK, Mr. Ms. Nur Nurul. You can share your screen. Hello, Prof. Casey. Uh, I'm Nurul Aziza, representing our student and student to present three examples of PISA question and show you in two language left side in Bahasa and right side in English. Suri was asked by her mother to go to the market to buy two types of fish, of fish lajang and tuna fish. Her mother only gave 30000 and all of the money had to buy both types of fish. At one fish shop, Suri found the following prices. First, the price of six lajang fish and three tuna is 24,000. And two, the price of eight lajang fish and two tuna is 20,000. If each type of fish is the same size, how many fish of both types can Suri buy? The second question, Okay, so Prof. Stacy, this is the kind of question that we made. Do you have any recommendation? It is enough for visa assignment. 
Okay, so, um, yeah, I think um, it seems to me um, to be quite a, you know, a very good sort of question. And um, a as I understand it, the six and three, in so you'd really be trying to find the maximum number of fish she can buy. Is that the question? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I think probably, um, yeah, um, it is it is, it is a good question, and perhaps does she have to go and buy? Um, can she buy the fish one by one? I didn't understand that. Mm, okay. Uh, she want to. Are, are the prices different? Yeah, of course, different. At, at the different shops. Hmm. Sir? Look, I understand that you know you've just quickly translated to English. So, um, but yeah. So <laughs> we tried to. We have some simultaneous yes, equations. We, we have two simultaneous equations. Yeah. Right. And then the question is to ask the to find the maximum number of fish she can buy. Yeah, I am for two two children. Oh, yes, yeah, and so it would be quite. A, this is quite a challenging question, I think. Uh, I mean, but I think it's um, quite a realistic question. Yeah. So, um, and um, I'm just trying to think where the main. Um, the main challenge would come. Will it be, do you think, from for the student to work out what they have to do to mm -hmm. think about? And then, so probably it will be quite a, um, there will probably be quite a bit of a, a difficulty in the formulating for students. And then, I guess, carrying it out accurately perhaps isn't quite so hard. And then interpreting the answer would be quite easy. So I think it's probably going to fit in the formulating car category. Mm, so may categorize. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, do you have a recommendation for me to make this? Uh, Sentence more be perfect. Um, look, I. So to me, we need to know that um, we just need a little bit more information, don't we? Mm -hmm. We need to know: can we buy one fish at the, at the shop, or do you have to buy six? Oh, should we buy one fish? You can buy one fish. Mm -hmm. Okay, but okay. they knows she knows the total, just the totals. Okay. Yeah. So, I I think that's all I would I would think it. I think that a little bit more information. Oh. Yeah, that that you can buy one fish. It's mm -hmm. not just that you must buy this basket. Of fish. Yeah. So if I had to buy the whole basket, you know, then no, no, I no. would. <laughs> yeah, but I can buy just. I could buy two x. I could spend twenty four and then buy mm. two more fish, for example. Twenty four. Okay. Yeah. So I think a little, a little bit more information, and it would be nice, perhaps, to try to think of a realistic way that um, for example you could have you, know, you don't want to make the story too long but perhaps she knew that someone well so and the price is also yeah so the price of one fish is the same in both baskets okay so we baskets? can make more information like uh, yes. in one packet is the price what it says and then yeah. if we buy one 
uh, in one side of fees you can how many price does like that yes yeah, mm -hmm. so maybe um, I don't know she knew that <laughs> someone had gone and bought this for 24,000 mm -hmm. and someone bought that for 20,000 and then she wanted to work out how much they cost okay yeah. it is too much information is better for the question I think you need that extra information to in English mm -hmm. in English in the English version I need that extra information to solve the problem mm. I think. Okay, okay. but maybe in the uh, Bahasa maybe it is already good I don't mm. know. yeah I don't know <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> Yeah, actually, uh, uh, our question is uh, very long, and we won't make it uh, effectively, effectively explain to the students. Yeah, yes. Okay, I will try. Um, it. Can, can, can I just say it's probably mm -hmm. because it does take the student a while to understand that question doesn't it then maybe it might be an opportunity to ask more than one question about the same situation mm. that's one of the reasons why the PISA items have usually not always they have more than one question about the situation so about the sale there were three questions about the sale and the uh, do you remember the one the sailing ship that I showed you and that is so that the students they spend some time understanding the context and then they can they get to do show do more mathematics show more things rather than changing the context a lot every time do you understand? Did I make myself clear, Muslim? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And if it's okay, if we input a data that that not important enough, uh, for example, uh, at this time we we offer a fish maybe, and the price is like that. But if we input a data maybe, uh, uh, maybe a vegetable, the price is. Uh, like slides, you know. could we it will input the information that are not appropriate in the sentence? Yeah. So you mean could you also add other information mm -hmm. that is yes. not needed? Yeah. So in the PISA questions, that is very common, and one of the reasons is because in real life, that is also very common. Okay. Yeah, but of course it does make it harder for students. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that sometimes mm -hmm. they get information they don't need. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, yeah, you know, not yeah, you know, so that um, we don't want students to think that the teacher only ever gives them the numbers that mm -hmm. they must use. You know, that they need to think well I have to think about this question <laughs> am I how would a sensible person do it mathematics is a sensible thing it makes it makes sense I don't need that so when it comes naturally then I think that's quite a good thing to do you wouldn't maybe not want to deliberately do it all the time yeah because as I know that a part of critical thinking is should understand about the question right so maybe it is just to uh, make sure the student uh, read uh, reading in the right way yeah yes and mm. so with many of these things um, you you there are, you really want to make an 
you want to help students develop an at an, an attitude, don't mm -hmm. you? Um, that I've got to do something sensible here. Yeah, you know, mathematics is going to help me solve this problem sensibly. I don't just take some numbers and quickly calculate something. I really think which is the important things to do. And so one of the yeah having information that you have to sort through would be sometimes I think that would be a good feature in some questions and you need to have something that fits some information yeah. that fits in <laughs> you know you don't want to um, I don't think you want to give how old her mother is <laughs> yes okay my friend will ask a question uh, Okay, so um, your voice was a bit breaking up a little bit, but I think that you're asking um, how can you be sure that you make a good set of questions for your students to to ha to work on? Is yeah, is that I think that is that a good is that a short summary of your question? Yeah, so. If you're working together in your course, across the whole course you could have questions of many different sorts and you could try to you could categorize them. Now I don't think it matters if the categories are not exactly the same as the PISA categories. You know, because you can um, you know e e every what you want I think is breadth you want to look across a lot of areas so for example the for the context PISA uses everyday life it uses jobs occupations it uses slightly scientific things not much science information but you know like the sales that was classes and it uses being a good citizen so you could think across all of these items do you do all of those things and then it's the same with the obviously with the content you will probably want you know you'll need to do them for different types of um, you know, the different different content that you have but I think the idea especially for PISA is to really think very carefully what are the important topics and what are the really main ideas that we really want students to understand you know so I think say proportional reasoning you know to understand ratio proportion and percentage that's very very important for everybody in algebra you're probably trying to get the basic idea of variation and functions you know how they how they change you so I think the other thing that PISA tries to do is to assess the mathematics the core mathematics that you think is really going to be important to people as they go on at school 
but also in their everyday lives you know sort of rather than as as a mathematics teacher you have to teach um, you, there's certain things that you have to teach because they will prove to be important later on you know so you might for example have to factorize a quadratic equation because it is going to be important later on but there are also topics that are going to be important for everybody all of the time in their ordinary life yeah, so you know, I think there is so much to say about this but because if a lot of you work together you could get a wonderful bank of questions for students of different age different ability different topics fantastic It is enough, Ms. Arsani. Does the topic have to be realistic? Okay, yes, yep, okay. So, in the past, until now, all of the PISA questions, with maybe one or two exceptions out of a hundred, out of many hundred, okay, have had a realistic context. Now, in PISA 2022, we will have questions with, there will be some questions without a realistic, um, without a realistic context. There will be some questions, for example, about number patterns. So that is what is happening in PISA. But as a mathematics teacher and as leaders, you know, people thinking about how the what the curriculum should be, you must make sure that your students learn mathematics with understanding and expect that it is going to make sense and that it's going to be useful to them in their lives. There is no benefit to be a mathematics teacher, in my opinion, if students do not know what that the things that they have learnt could be used. So I think you have to decide you know you have to look i love the pure mathematics questions you know my my phd is in number theory so i really love just to under, to look at mathematical patterns and i'm sure it's really important but i do know that for nearly every student it will they will want mathematics because of the how they can use it in their life you know, so I have a passion I want to share it but I must also make sure that you give other pe the students what they need ok thank you prof uh, can we uh, discuss uh, continue to the next question. Okay, I will explain uh, the sample question number two. Next. Number two.
The COVID-19 in Indonesia has spread to all provinces based on the result of the government monitoring on the February 26, 2021. It was noted that the distribution was as shown in the image beside. From this data, find the percentage of patient age under, ni under 19 years who recovered on February 26, 2021 from all of the patient age less than 19 years the second is find which are fit which age group has the highest cure rate hmm. yeah, so in australia because of covid mathematical models are talked about by all people every day and everyone talks about the exponential function now. <laughs> so this is obviously a very topical um, question. It would be very much like a PISA question. Um, of course, your question is very current. The PISA questions have to last they have to be made years in advance. Yeah, so this is so, so good because it is about now. And that's something that you can do as a teacher, even though you can't do it when you're writing an international assessment that goes through years of development. So this, uh, I think the first one, <laughs> the percentage of patients age 19, there's a lot of data um, that they have to they have to look at, aren't they? And then um, they have to pick out the relevant data. And it seems to me that this is an important sort uh, important thing for students to be able to do. Um, and then the second one, second question, I think has you've got to do. I imagine um, that you would have to compare various the same sort of information for different age groups. Um, so I think those are two very, um, you know, they would certainly be very realistic and um, very up to date, the sort of things that your students ought to know how to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, based on uh, high order thinking, it is uh, enough appropriate to measure about high order thinking of students. Uh, um, so the question is, well, what would be the higher order thinking in this one? Yeah, it is the question, it is enough to measure about the high order thinking of the students. Yeah, so um, PISA doesn't say that some parts of the framework are higher order thinking and mm -hmm. some aren't. Mm -hmm. So when the, um, the idea of PISA is that uh, when you're setting a test like that, you must have easy items mm -hmm. in every category oh. and hard items in oh. every category. Yeah. So um, so a part of just like there are there are questions um, about involving algebra and questions involving number, there are easy, medium, and difficult items mm -hmm. in every category. So PISA hasn't used the word higher order thinking. Now, yeah. um, obviously, in some of these questions, students have to be able to um, plan yeah, okay yep I think if you look at the skills mm -hmm. the way that PISA has analyzed what makes for example a level six problem you can see that level six problems are made by creating a mathematical model, mm -hmm. um, looking at representations. There's a whole list 
of quite concrete ways uh, that make for difficult and complex items. So rather than saying, um, so this PISA does say that the students um, students say at level six and level five can use higher order thinking. I don't know they use that 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 phrase, but certainly you know you can see a difference in the quality of thinking between the the students who do who achieve a very high level and the students who achieve a low level. So I'm not sure if that answered the question, um, but. So, for example, it's not that calculation is regarded as low level by PISA, mm -hmm. um, but it would not make, it doesn't make the profile of a high level of a person who can do higher order thinking. You have to have a lot of, they have to be able to do more than that. Okay. Thank you. I <laughs> see. Interesting yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have any comment, Mr. Sani, about this question? Yet? Huh? Oh, yeah. Okay. Before I uh, go to the next question, maybe any comment from another participant? Mr. Abdel, you can offer to you, your friend <laughs> uh, well participant maybe you want to ask related to the question on this screen please kindly ask your question Dada. Okay. okay, maybe they just uh, prepare for the question. <laughs> okay, I think I will uh, 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 explain about the next question, Prof. Daisy. I want your recommendation. <laughs> No. Question three, Miss Nurul. Question yang, yeah. Okay. The next question is: Sri Kandi has a shop that sells various types of clothing, one of which is tie dye shirt. When the script, when Sri Kandi managed to sell two more t shirt he will get the same amount for of money. Where the selling price of each teaser is twenty thousand, cheaper than the normal selling price. If Sri Kandi sell two shirt less, he will get the some money. Where the selling price of each shirt is forty thousand more than the normal price, and find how many shirt that Sri Kandi can sell and the normal selling price of the shirt. Okay. So, I have written a lot of questions like this. Okay. <laughs> I think, I'm j I, but I have only, just looking very quickly at your question and not mm -hmm. thinking very deeply. I think okay. you are trying to describe um, different algebraic relations, uh, algebraic equations, and putting them into the into the um, the shirts context. Yeah, you're Shirt trying context. to. Yeah, is that right? you um, so if you get two more, um, you'll get the same x as you know. We've got um, n times the price plus two times the price equals. Um, N plus two times the price minus twenty thousand. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying that is correct, but you, you've got a good equ some good equations there, mm -hmm. and you're asking students to solve those set up and solve those equations. 
Okay. I think that's what's happening. And um, it's actually very difficult, isn't it, to write um, questions with these complex algebraic relationships that sound realistic. I have often had this problem myself. Mm -hmm. So I think that I think that is what I think that's what is happening here. And so I would think this is probably an exercise in solving simultaneous equations. I don't think that um, as it wouldn't be counted as a PISA question unless you could sort of package it in a way that made more sort of common sense. If there was some way that, how would he know these things without, if he didn't know how much the shirts cost, how much, how would he know it? Do you know, it seems to me that this question passes a mathematical test, but doesn't pass common sense quest I, I could I think it has a role in a mathematics textbook but you we would not say I don't think you would say that it was the sort of question that would convince mm -hmm. people that mathematics is important okay yeah so it's not that I I don't like the question and that you know, I don't. Uh, you know, may I haven't haven't really haven't solved it yet, but you know, it's very. Um, it doesn't. If you look at it from a student who was thinking, do I is mathematics useful to me at school? What I, is what I'm learning useful? Would not be convinced by this question. Mm. So I don't mean it's not a good question that you could, you know, obviously you could ask for translation, mm. you know, to, for students to practice simultaneous equations, but I don't think it would be a convincing, you know, convincing to the government that we're so pleased our students can do this. Okay. How about if we uh, add some picture? Uh, so I think they will be help understand more uh, what the beneficial the the, the question. It is possible. Yeah. Yes. We could. Um, so. <laughs> You've got to explain why he doesn't know the cost of his selling. Oh. Why, why Shri Candy doesn't know how much his shirts cost. Mm, yeah, yeah, I got it. I get it. Now I know sometimes that it, you know I'm I'm not saying that simultaneous equations is never useful. Uh, but I think that this sort of problem doesn't show the use well. Mm. So I think if we look at it, Shri Candy, he's really making this as a puzzle for his friends, isn't he? <laughs> Yeah. Not for his shop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um uh, how to say uh, it's, it's not easy for me to <laughs> to explain about uh how to make this question more understandable by the students uh, in realistic, uh, actually. So, yes, yeah, if, yes. we, if we change the question, it may be just like, uh, if you want to buy short, 
uh, sick or and how how many uh, how many patients you will be effort there? Could we be better? Mm. How to say? So uh, okay, okay. Uh, my friend will help the patient. Um, I'm sorry. Again, you were slightly breaking breaking up. So you were t talking about the context, the, the the stimulus, the first part of the writing of the PISA question. I think is that right? Right. And the actual question was, and what was the? Could you repeat the question part, please? So um, you're The translation is done very, in a very complicated way. They write first in any language, translate to English, translate to to the say Bahasa, you know, I Indonesian language, and then they translate that back to English to see if it matches. And in some languages, there are some questions that cannot be asked. So, you know, in, in a simple in a simple way, or sometimes the language makes the question too simple to ask. So, some of the the idea is that the writing will be as easy as possible, but still making it a realistic situation. Uh, and then you asked a question also about how deep the analysis is. So. This is really an empirical question 
okay. about what students mm -hmm. can do around the world. In PISA, the job is to say how well the country can do and to give scores. That, that's what the job is to do. And if everyone gets a question wrong, it doesn't give any information. So PISA questions cannot be too hard. In fact, most of the questions that come from right, people submit questions for PISA from all around the world. Nearly all of them are far too hard. And that, so because you're trying to look at differences between people, if 90% of people get something wrong, it doesn't tell you much. Low discrimination. If 90% get it right, no discrimination. So you have to pick questions that are sort of spread out, but mainly in a sort of sweet spot. Now that's something that you don't have to do, but you do have to do it for writing an international assessment. So the hardest item on PISA 2012 had a success rate of about 4%. And really, um, it should not have been asked, but it was such a lovely item, we did ask it anyway. So I, I, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, as you know that uh, Indonesian, Indonesia in PISA score or PISA rank is in 71 is to low, uh, to low, <laughs> and, um, but the fact in our country, every student in every year, they did national exam and their score is approximately high uh, and i don't know i think if the national exam is good it should be in there related to pisa score but it's not appropriate at today uh, i don't know what happened uh, maybe uh, maybe if in the translation uh, Indonesian assignment to English assignment is not appropriate with PISA or what do you think about this? What do you think? Okay, so um, I think that it's unlikely, it's possible but unlikely that the difference is due to say the translation Mm -hmm. or uh, items that are not appropriate. So certainly for PISA 2012, and I think for the next, P for every PISA, every item is sent in advance to every country. And they are asked whether it fits their curriculum and whether the situation is suitable for their students. Mm -hmm. And then um, those, that information causes many items to be discarded. When we did PISA 2012, we needed 200, 200 new items. Oh, so and we we wrote 800 new items and during these processes mm -hmm. 600 items were thrown out okay so about 400 so they go because as i say sometimes it's they're not able to be translated okay. sometimes an issue is too sensitive maybe for Arabic people, 
Mm. Yeah. So you, we can, you can't, it's not the case for every single item that no item would ever be unsuitable for a question. But mm. overall, every country has a say in that. And with the translation, it also goes two ways. You, English to, say, Bahasa, mm -hmm. and then Bahasa back to English to see if the English is the same. Yeah. A back translation, do you know? Yeah. yeah. So now it wouldn't be the case that every item is good. Mm. You know, there's probably, you know, things will happen, but the processes are quite careful. It might be the case that this, the, um, I think the, well, a very important thing is that PISA measures an average. It measures an average for your country. And um, the average is not the same as the students who do really well. And all of us, I think, have a bias to think, oh, you know, these students, they do this, they do that, do that, that. So there is automatically a bias, perhaps. Um, and then maybe, um, do students do students who do the PISA test do they try? You know, do they, do they see it as an important thing to do? In some countries, we know that students feel that they are representing their country. You know that it's an honour to be chosen in a random sample. And in other other countries, like we think Australia, the students really have a very they don't care yeah you know, they just come and write a few things and then go some people think that's why australia has a is getting worse because our students care less yeah so um i can't answer the question <laughs> um <laughs> but uh, also i think an orient you know students there are some basic things students need to know and i think just understanding how mathematics is applied in the real world mm. and that you might, you know, those sorts of things are important. There, can I just say one other thing? Um, I showed you several multiple choice questions, uh, not multiple choice, multiple step questions. Multiple steps. And that means you have to get everything right mm -hmm. to get to school, don't you? You can't just make a little mistake in the middle. Okay. And I, I, I think that's, um, you know, if you think how many students in your class make a little mistake in the middle, you know, so you really do have to go back and check. I don't know. I'm sorry I can't answer the question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, oh, can I just mm -hmm. say, the other thing is, mm -hmm. do you remember that the OECD notice noted mm -hmm. how the population of 15 year olds in Indonesia has grown enormously. Yeah. That shows to, for your schools to be able to deal with that change over 20 years mm -hmm. as it must be a great challenge, you know, for, for getting you know, a good education in all parts of the country. It must be very, very hard. So I think that you're trying to do a very important thing by increasing the level of education for everyone and it perhaps doesn't show that some places are getting better. Yeah, it's going to be our challenge. <laughs> yeah. well, we, I think we should be more in learn and in education. I think it is enough for me, uh, Prof. Stacey. Thank you so much for your recommendation and we it's my honor to uh, have a discussion with you. <laughs> I will be back to you, the moderator, Ms. Abel. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Riyadi, Muslim. We come to Q &A session. So feel free for each of you to ask directly to Prof. Stacy, particularly for our lectures. Mrs. Laila, Mr. Budi, Prof. Budi, uh, Mr. Mardiana, Mr. Ikar, and Mr. Imam. But before that, 
I will read the question in chat box from Mr. Bagus. The indicator for modeling in PISA is interpreting mathematical model context or reality. Is RME able to increase the score on the PISA indicator? Yeah. So I think this is an interesting question um, because I know that RME is quite strong in Indonesia and the people from the Netherlands, from the Freudenthal Institute, were also very influential in setting up mathema the PISA mathematics. So the first chair of the International Mathematics Committee was the head of the Freudenthal Institute in Mathematics, so um, Jan, De, Jan De Langer. So um, I think that the spirit of RME is really very important to understand, to, to being good on um, on the mod on the modelling and the sort of things that went be went behind PISA. It's the same sort of thinking that. I understand RME, you know, has um, they RME does two things to, in my understanding. It takes the real world in order to develop mathematical concepts, and then also it uses the mathematical concepts to understand the real world. So that it, it's a double thing, isn't it? You go from the real world or a realistic problem to develop mathematical. Concepts that's very strong in RME, and then you need also to go from the mathematical concepts to un re understand the real world. So, I would think that RM, um, RME is you know really a very strong foundation for those sorts of things, and you could build on that in Indonesia. Well, do you have any feedback, Mr. Bagus? Or is it just enough for the answer? It's enough, enough. Well, maybe there is another question from other participants. Maybe from Mr. Imam Sujadi. From Mr. Rudy, maybe our head department of mathematics education. Oh. Okay. Yeah, you can ask directly to the Prof. Stacy, Mr. Ingham. I read in 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 the chat box. Ah. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so everybody's got the question in the chat box. So, is what is there research or surveys conducted by the OECD to look at um, the countries, um, say the high countries and the low countries, to see the factors that cause those sorts of scores? Um, so there is a lot. The OECD has a lot of um, a, a lot produces a lot of reports on this sort of question. So for example, the sorts of questions they're looking at is um, to what extent funding for schools causes increased performance. Um, they look at how schools are organised. Are there are studies of school climate 
whether students feel that um, the teachers help them learn, whether um, they feel that uh, they're bullied at school. Um, for example, I noticed um, you know, that, um, there was in some of the questionnaires, the Indonesian schools had quite a high level of students saying they were bullied. Do you know what I mean by bullied? You know, sort of um, other students not nice to them. So there is a huge array of different things. One of the very interesting things that happened very early with PISA is that Germany expected to be very, very good on the first PISA's, PISA results. And they found they were quite low. And many people at that stage, one of the important question, the questions that the PISA was trying to look at was, should everybody go to the same school in secondary school or should children go to some students go to low level schools some to medium level technical schools and some to high level schools that go to university and germany had that sort of three layers and it was found in the early pisa that school systems which were comprehensive where everyone went to the same sort of school were doing better so some people said, well, the problem in Germany is that it's these selective schools, three layers of school. And so since then, Germany has been working on improving and they have improved, but they have not changed their school structure. They still have three layers, but every year, since that time they have gone up. So it's very hard to say exactly what, there's no magic bullet here. Different countries have to find out what works for them. In Australia, we are going down and we don't know why. So I don't sure is that, yeah, so, so many, so many different so many different possible answers but many 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 research reports on the on the um, on the website yeah okay, okay. yeah okay so I, there's another question in the ch the chat from Weedy shall I answer this one You've got an, a question at the qualitative research, how to make a piece of interest, but how many steps to make it? And what is a simple guide to do that? Okay. Um, well, um, each PISA assessment starts four years, at least, before it runs. And there are many, many, many steps. Um, and that's partly because it is so big, you know, it's trying to do things for questions everywhere in the world. Um, even the one simple questionnaire and the other thing is there are very, very many teams. There are probably, um, there are many meetings of hundreds of people involved. So it's really a very big, complicated thing. They do, they do try to build on academic research that is uh, showing promise. So for example, um, opportunity to learn, you know, that, that's, there's a lot of study about, you know, the uh, general education research about how opportunity to learn determines things. And that's partly why I showed you those questions on the frequency, how often students said they'd done a question about train timetables or discounted prices or something like that. And that 
those questionnaires came from not the actual questions but the idea behind it came from research on opportunity to learn so the idea is that it builds on research that's going on as well as then you have to create the instruments yourself um, but you could um, it, and then of course when students finish students do their examination they do their test their two and a half hours then they're coded or put into a database and then there's a huge amount of statistics that has to go on for this to check that things are right to do the scaling the rash it's all based on I don't know if you know rash modeling so um, I don't know how many steps to make it I'm sorry <laughs> yeah. but we did write a book about the mathematics book it's called assessing mathematical literacy um, and it's myself and Ross Turner wrote that book in 2015 Okay. Well, maybe there are other questions from Prof. Diana or Dr. Laila and Dr. Imam. Yeah, there is question from Mr. Imam. Maybe I I can help you, Prof. Stacy, to read it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I read your book on assessing mathematical literacy. You wrote that in solving numeracy problems, there is a process of formulating, employing, and interpreting. Do these three processes have to appear in compiling PISA type question? Yeah. Okay. So, th th so this is about the three processes of formulating, diving into the water, employing, swimming through the water, through the mathematical water doing the calculations and interpreting, climbing out on the other side to face, to see if the mathematical solution has answered Hello. the real world question. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah. So, yeah. I think this question, every, in PISA, every item, uh, in PISA 2012, every item is classified as one of those three things. So, um, and I think in PISA 2022, every item will be cl classified either as mathematical reasoning, formulating, employing, interpreting. So we've got it, the extra one, the mathematical reasoning without context will be there. Now, the difficulty of course is that it's very hard to say um, PISA items generally do not have all three because that would make the item too long you know it, it makes the item too complex so but very often there'll be two and the committee would sit and discuss which was the most demanding where where an item should be classified so in theory you could write you should write items really that focus on that one that one or that one and the reason why you have to do that is it's an unrealistic thing to do in real life you know you're going to imp you know to solve the the modeling for covid of course you do formulate employ interpret formulate employ interpret evaluating going round and round in a cycle um yeah, but for a PISA assessment, short items, very often you could think one or two would be strong. And unfortunately, you have to put them in, you have to make a fairly arbitrary decision about which one sometimes, or leave out the item. Yeah. Um, the, those, the performance on those three processes correlates very highly. And I think so one possibility of course is that students who can do one are good at the other you know sort of by and large um, but another possibility is because in 2012 we had to take items that had already been written and pro and 
allocate them whereas in 2022 for the new items they could write specifically to one thing or the other and so that might might change it a little bit um, so but if a question is realistic the process will appear the question is how many of them Mr. Imam, do you have any feedback? Okay, uh, it's the process. Uh, it's the process. Uh, hierarchical level, or it is a uh, blend. It is solving your problems. Yeah. C can you explain a little bit more? Uh, when students. Uh, They didn't think a uh, three process formulating, implying, and interpreting. Uh, uh, yes, this is a uh, hierarchies, or this is blended with uh, someone uh, to process a. Uh, to solve the problems. Uh, well, uh, the Mr. Imam said that uh, how about those three process? Does it student have to make it uh, for their self or or other student or maybe teacher could help to do that process? Is that uh, am I right, Mr. Imam, yes. about your question? Uh, it's the process uh, hierarchical. Here, oh, here here level. Uh, like yeah. there have to be in order so yes. from the formulating uh, process, uh, problem solving or it is a blended as a problem solving that uh, they have uh, employee in the bread and formulate okay so uh, real mathematical modeling you know, we start with a problem that we want to solve and then you have to turn it into mathematics yeah. and then you do things with the mathematics and then you look at what you've got and you see if this is a sensible answer and if it is you, you say you stop and if it isn't, you need to go back to the start and change some of your assumptions. So there is a cycle of doing using mathematics for mathematical modelling. However, sometimes items can come in the middle of that. Do you know, they can, um, you've probably forgotten, but for example, the sale question about the triangle already somewhat that the triangle was already drawn the 90 degree right angle was already marked the distances were marked and so in a sense the formulating had been done in that item so that then the item is then get classified as the next step so in real life, of course, you know, you would go in sequence, but in PISA items, you have to have some items that focus there or focus there or focus there if you want to report how good students are. So, so 2012 was the first time that this was done um, and of course, it, there is no more data since 2012 because the, the main domain has been reading and science. So all since 2012, only a few questions have been asked about, mathemat about mathematics and not enough to, ex to see what is happening with those processes or the content areas, just the overall score for mathematics. Since, since 2012. So it will be very interesting to see what happens in 2022 results. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the end of the Q&A session. Thank you for all your active participation and questions. Before we close this agenda, please, Prof. Stacy, kindly give your closing statement about PISA, especially Indonesian PISA. Indonesian oh, okay. Um, well, thank you ever so much for all those interesting questions. And you'll see that um, PISA is the largest educational study in the world. And you might think that the largest study in the world could answer all of the questions in the world. But as you've asked your questions, you can see that there are many things that we don't know. And something like PISA points to possibilities of answers and it points to areas where you could improve. It doesn't really tell you exactly what your country should do. And that relies on having really good educators and people who are thinking deeply about mathematics and the mathematics that students need to learn really to make that better. I think um, the other statement is that the rank you know, 71st in the world or 21st in the world, wherever it is, is only one thing that comes out of PISA. And this work at looking at how you can create PISA-like questions for Indonesia, I think is very, very rich. I think there are a lot of things, that, you know, if you can get good sets of questions and they don't have to be exactly like PISA. What they need to do is to try to be questions that convince students that mathematics is a subject that's worth learning and that it'll be useful in their lives. They don't have to go and be a university mathematician for mathematics to be useful in their lives. If you can do that with your bank of questions and build it up so that you make it a sort of comprehensive bank you know, looking at formulating, looking at employing, looking at interpreting, looking at different areas, and not just 15 year olds either. Now, this is something, the teaching of making mathematics, a, you know, um, a, a useful subject for people, teaching mathematical literacy has to start from the beginning of school. It's a whole school thing. It's not just a 15 year old thing because P, the OECD happens to test that level. Um, so um, I think um, there have been so many really good questions and lovely problems to look at. And um, so yeah, I, I hope that you'll all um, keep going and doing th these sorts of things because you know, it's really important to all of us that our students do well in mathematics. And if they do well in mathematics, it means yeah, you know, for their real lives, it means doing well in mathematical literacy. So, well, thank you, Prof. Stacey. Uh, maybe there is some work from our head of mathematics education department, Dr. Budi. Miss April. Uh, maybe there is some word that you want to say before I close this agenda. Uh, you can say in bahasa. Boleh pakai bahasa Indonesia. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, dear Prof. K. Stacy, I say many, many thanks was agreed to be speaker at a case lecture in our study program. The case lecture activity aims to increase students' insight, our student knowledge into several materials 
that can be used uh, this topics. I hope the material is presented by Prof. KSTC will be able to develop by our student and our lecturers because many students and lecturers do research on PISA. In the end, we apologize if this activity is not pleasing. Thank you. Yes. Yes, uh, Ms. Apel. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Woody. So let me highlight one point on this international lecture agenda. Don't just look at overall PISA score or PISA rank, but we have to pay more attention to mathematical literacy of provincial level and mathematical process. Okay, before I close this agenda, please, I invite all of you to give your sweetest smile because we want to take a picture as documentation. Please turn on your camera, all of the participants. Okay. One, two, three. Please. Uh, once more, the slide two. One, two, three. Well, thank you for making time in your busy schedule to join us. I wish you all place and day. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. Okay. See you. Yeah. Lovely to see you all. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck at school. <laughs> <laughs> yes.